Todd has been active in the ethanol industry since the 1970s, as well as been very active on a state and national basis over the last, um, you know, this buildup of through the buildup of ethanol, and now into the the new realms of ethanol as we um, look to other types of feedstocks, and as well as we look to the challenges of ethanol in uh, the year two, 2012 with the drought, with the challenges to the real fuel standard, and other things. So, um, welcome, Todd, and I'm going to turn it over to Todd Sneller, the administrator of the Nebraska Ethanol Board. Thank you, John, and good morning to all who are listening today. Thank you for joining us. John had posed a series of questions for me, and I'm going to begin by addressing the first of those, which was to explore what current ethanol facilities are doing to respond to the challenges that come with high commodity prices. Let me begin by just providing a quick overview of what we have in terms of national production picture. We, as you can see, have 212 ethanol facilities that are up and capable of operation. They're producing in the past year about 14.75 billion gallons of ethanol. 13.6 billion gallons of production is currently online. We have an additional capacity that's not in use at this point. It's construction that's underway in a variety of different locations and some capacity additions in a couple locations as well. The largest of these plants, of course, are very large plants producing more than 400 million gallons a year. Our smaller plants range from quite small of a few million gallons a year on up to probably the average, which ranges between 50 and 100 million gallons a year for the dry mill corn plants. In 2011, starch from about 5 billion bushels of corn was produced to make 13.9 billion gallons a year of ethanol, and this contributed about 39 million metric tons of distiller's feed for use primarily in the livestock industry. A number of things are being undertaken in terms of strategies for dealing with high commodity prices. These are, in many cases, fairly routine management practices. In other cases, management practices that have been the product of the higher commodity prices and continuing need to become more efficient in order to sustain profitability. As we take a look at what currently drives U.S. ethanol production, Clearly, the renewable fuel standard is the factor that is of most importance, both in production and use of ethanol in the United States. High gasoline prices relative to ethanol prices also stimulate discretionary blending beyond the requirements of the renewable fuel standard. And in 2011, in particular, we saw this with many plants producing more than their rated capacity in order to meet a robust market that was driven by significant differential between and gasoline prices. As a result of that price differential, many marketers and refiners of fuel products chose to go beyond the required RFS use and employ this discretionary blending standard to take advantage of the high octane, lower price characteristics of ethanol. Distillers feed prices during tight corn supplies and at that period of higher corn prices are a function of profitability that's very important. Uh, distillers feed exports to China as a result of resolution of a trade issue that was present in 2011 are also driving demand, increasing the value of distillers feed. And in many states we're seeing, particularly in this time of higher corn prices, that the viability and economic practicality of using distillers grains is, is very well understood. And again, that's one of the factors driving demand for distillers feeds and running up the prices for distillers' feeds, which helps offset the higher cost of corn for the ethanol producer. These distillers' feeds are clearly a proven hedge against higher corn prices because as the cost of corn has gone up, the value of the distillers' feeds have gone up. And again, that's driven in part by demand that comes to some extent from the cutback in ethanol production presently, but also this factor of a growing and very robust export demand for distillers' feeds. As a result of the use of distillers' feeds and feed rations, we're also continuing to receive confirmation through extraordinary research being done by many of the university representatives present today and many of the universities that we work with, including the University of Nebraska, and also getting direct feedback from the livestock industry itself about the fact that really one of the very most efficient feeding strategies 
is wet distillers feeds, in other cases dry distillers feeds with a combination of other products, but clearly this is a factor that helps to improve efficiency, and so at a time of high corn prices, this is a benefit to the livestock industry as well. Wet distillers feed product are really a, an enormous opportunity, particularly in those states that are suffering the drought conditions today, and we're seeing a lot of poor quality roughage around that otherwise has very low value, but in combination with the wet distillers feeds is producing a, a good ration for cattle, and as a result of that, we're seeing good performance even with the diminished herds out there and, and with drought stress. This is obviously a factor that's been important in the past, and we're seeing the importance of that factor during the current drought period as well. Distiller solubles are also now considered an asset to product portfolio. Many of the early dry mill ethanol plants were in imbalance with distiller solubles, and oftentimes it was viewed as a product that just needed to be disposed of. We're seeing a lot of good research and good utilization of distiller solubles as there's an effort to use everything coming out of the ethanol plants, and those distiller solubles are being demonstrated to be very valuable as part of a livestock feed configuration that a number of different feeders are employing throughout the Midwest, and we're seeing some very good research coming out of a number of universities, including the University of Nebraska, and coming together with feed rations that incorporate distiller solubles. One of the trends that as recently as three years ago was viewed as too risky for ethanol producers because of the technology issues, some legal issues, but really just an unproven process technology at the time was corn oil extraction. We see many plants today, the dry mill plants, extracting corn oil, and that has helped in a number of ways, including diversifying their product portfolio, adding profitability, and opening up new marketing options for both the biofuel sector for use of that in its biofuel, but more importantly, perhaps use of it in a variety of different feedstock, feed applications for livestock, particularly in the poultry industry. Distillers feeds with lower oil content were initially viewed to be perhaps inferior to conventional distillers feeds, but the research that is being demonstrated at the present time indicates that we're really not seeing any loss in productivity with these lower oil contents, provided they stay in the 68% oil content range. And in fact, in many cases, particularly in poultry and pork rations, this lower oil product may be very important in terms of productivity and functionality in, in the diets. As ethanol margins diminish, a plant can oftentimes choose to reduce production. We're seeing that in many locations around the U.S. We're seeing a few plants go into temporary hiatus. That's not unusual to take an inspection and maintenance period. Some of those are extended periods at the present time, but in many cases these plants expect to resume operation come fall harvest time. The strategy that other plants are employing, of course, is that they simply cut back production to somewhere between 70 and perhaps 80 percent, and this is fairly common practice today in the dry mill plants, and it's an effort to cut back the corn demand that they're imposing on local markets, and obviously that helps reduce demand overall, but that's a factor that's been very important in sustaining the operation of these plants, even though it's at a reduced capacity. Obviously, the reduced ethanol production diminishes corn demand, particularly in local markets, and thereby reduces pressure on cash corn prices locally, which helps both livestock feeders and ethanol producers. The downside of that, however, is that there's a robust demand today for the distiller's feeds, and to the extent that we're seeing this cutback in production capacity, there's a corresponding cutback in distiller's feed supply. That's obviously of some concern to the livestock industry, so it's a very care careful balancing act in terms of making sure that ethanol profitability is sustained, but at the same time, uh, we don't uh, create disharmony in some of the markets that have become very important uh, and very closely integrated, including livestock and ethanol production. Transportation economics are really an essential component of profitability, and that's an area in which there's a real push for efficiency today, particularly in this tough economic times. We're seeing many of the dry mill plants that previously had fairly modest rail infrastructure, making capital commitments of up to about $3 million to put unit train capacity in their plants. This is especially important because it, it uh, facilitates rapid turnaround to distant markets in terms of bringing rail cars back more quickly. It requires fewer rail cars to stay in service that way because of the more rapid turnaround time, and it helps transportation economics because these plants are able to 
load and ship unit trains and take advantage of that freight efficiency. Most of the plants are highly focused on best practices and this concept of optimization, which is a management goal of um, any good manager. They're able to do this through a variety of different practices, obviously technologies that allow them to use less water, less enzymes, uh, extract higher yields from their corn in terms of ethanol output, improve the quality and output of their distiller's feeds, and overall optimize, oftentimes through a series of modest capital improvements that are brought about with uh, new equipment that is fully designed for optimization and control within the plants. This is particularly clear when a plant has reached perhaps seven years of age or so. At that point, many of the control systems are a little bit obsolete, and so with a modest capital investment, there can be some additions made to the plant that allow more control efficiency within the plant and therefore optimization of both the equipment and the process and procedures. And interestingly enough, in talking to a Western Nebraska ethanol plant manager this year, he said there are some things that are very, very simple. For example, they had chosen not to keep up a nice green lawn surrounding their entire plant. They're just not doing any landscaping. They're simply letting that go, saving about $100,000. He said they've got a very good management group that knows how to take care of equipment, they know how to work with uh, used equipment, and their rule is, is never buy used equipment, never buy uh, new equipment. They, they focus on buying used equipment and count on their staff to make sure that it's got a long and productive life, thereby reducing capital cost. John had also raised the question of what are the current ethanol plants able to do in terms of serving as potential host sites for advanced biofuel production. And in fact, in a number of states, including Nebraska and Iowa, the strategy is really to focus on those campuses as the primary places in which advanced biofuel facilities may be located. And that's for a number of obvious reasons, is that the infrastructure requirements of the advanced biofuel facilities match up very closely to the existing dry mill ethanol plants and wet mill plants. And those plants represent a very complex set of infrastructure assets that can be deployed very nicely to meet the needs of advanced biofuel production. So we're seeing a number of partnerships. The first commercial undertaking we're seeing at this point has employed that strategy. And clearly from a transportation and an energy and um, a management perspective, uh, this is very efficient uh, strategy in terms of taking a look at best sites for advanced biofuel production. And I suspect that's a trend we'll continue to see into the future. In addition to that, what's been very clear in some of the discussions held between advanced biofuel development companies and their prospective site hosts in the dry mill ethanol industry is that the operating experience and management of the current ethanol plants is a huge asset. They have an enormous experience in many cases a decade or more, and they really understand that process and what can be done to optimize that and integrate the assets of the existing facility with the proposed facility. In addition, the existing plants have relationships with equipment vendors, technology firms, and perhaps most importantly, local feedstock providers. They also know a number of the other resource providers, particularly in the energy industry and transportation area, and they are typically good hosts and good partners with the local community so a new company coming in typically gets a good reception based on the credibility and the uh, relationship that the current plant has with the community itself. The transportation infrastructure, of course, is going to be much the same in terms of moving, moving advanced biofuels, particularly if they're produced in the Midwest. Their highest value will be on the east and west coast. And again, for that reason, the importance of transportation is illustrated as a, a key asset here. In addition to that, uh, a real important factor when you take a look at the capital cost of the advanced biofuels, particularly at commercial scale, will be the ability to take advantage of that infrastructure to help reduce capital cost, which uh, will help not only reduce the overall cost of that facility, but will facilitate integration of the startup of that plant as well. John had also asked me to touch on the impact of the volumetric ethanol excise tax credit as it expired at the end of 2011. Obviously, for a number of years, that was viewed as a primary incentive for marketing of ethanol fuels. But in fact, it did a little to enhance profitability for ethanol producers. As most know, the incentive was triggered 
when the fuel was, quote, manufactured, and that was an act of taking the ethanol and blending it with gasoline. Few of the ethanol companies were involved in that practice. That typically happens downstream and virtually, without exception, happens within the refining and marketing industry. And as a result of that, there really was not any real direct benefit, despite what uh, many have heard and, and how it's been portrayed in the past. In fact, during the debate in 2011, there were a number of ethanol company presidents who made it very clear that they felt that uh, one of the key things to do would be to get rid of that incentive and demonstrate that, in fact, they do have a product that can compete in any liquid transportation fuel marketplace. They continue to feel that ethanol is the best and lowest cost octane option in the world, and they feel that they can continue to offer a competitive and profitable product for use in the U.S. transportation fuel pool. And I think as we take a look at the example of companies like Valero and we see how a refining company has integrated ethanol production into the refinery stream and note the profitability of that asset and the profitability of that acquisition of Valero, it illustrates the point that the refining industry really can maximize the value of that, and they were quick to do that in 2010 and 11. In addition to that, a number of the ethanol companies that um, were most vocal about the subject of the VTEC made it very clear that getting the target off our back was going to be important in terms of public perception, in terms of demonstrating that, in fact, ethanol can stand on its own and can continue to be a viable and important part of the liquid transportation fuel pool within the United States. One of the real downsides of the VTEC as it got close to being uh, sunsetted was the fact that it really severely distorted ethanol demand in the fourth quarter of 2011 and the first quarter of 2012. And it did that because as long as there was ethanol and gasoline blended together, regardless of the level, it triggered the VTEC. And so we saw a huge push to purchase ethanol in the fourth quarter of 2011 and early into 2012, moving that into all available storage, particularly before the end of 2011. And as a result of that supply and uh, the triggering of VTEC there, there remained a good opportunity for consumers and marketers to use fuel that had the VTEC applied. But by having all that product and in inventory, it tended to create the sense that there was a significant demand. It was interpreted to be basically discretionary blending demand that, in fact, was not really a supply factor in the market at that time. And as a result of that, as we got into 2012, we saw that that huge volume of ethanol that was in storage started to bleed into the marketplace, and it started to quickly undermine real demand in the first and second quarters of 2012. And as a result of that, we saw a fairly significant price depression with ethanol prices dropping close to $2 per gallon in the Midwest. They've since rebounded as that supply that was in inventory has been used up in the marketplace, but clearly this was one of the downsides of VTEC as it was on its way out the door is that it also created this misleading demand trend that many companies responded to in the first quarter of 2012 by producing even more ethanol, which exacerbated the supply issue and as a result continued to put lower pressure on ethanol prices. John asked me to touch on the renewable fuel standard as well because it is a standard that continues to get a lot of scrutiny today for a host of reasons, and I'll review a few of those reasons. Here you see the picture of the renewable fuel standard from enactment and inception in RFS 2 in 2007 through the date at which it's supposed to hit peak demand in 2022, and that demand at the time is, is projected under current federal law to be about 36 billion gallons per year. This is made up of a combination of advanced biofuels and conventional biofuels. Current ethanol use today, as you can see in the chart here, has been one that has been basically limited to just above what would constitute a nationwide 10% blend integration, which is what is allowed by current law. And as a result of that, we've hit this so-called blend wall, and we've seen a little bit of incremental additional use in E85, uh, some exploratory um, attempts to market E15, which has had not had much of an impact at this point. But we do see a situation where, despite these upward requirements for RFS in terms of using advanced biofuels and conventional biofuels, it's extraordinarily difficult to do that in the current marketplace. And so that remains a practical challenge, despite what the standard calls for. 
we see in 2022 uh, a, an increasingly big demand on how we integrate more and more of these gallons of biofuel. And again, it really doesn't matter whether this is conventional corn-based ethanol or an advanced biofuel made from some more esoteric feedstock. The fact is these molecules have got to find a home in a liquid transportation fuel market in the U.S., which continues to shrink because of fuel efficiency and because of the economy. So a significant challenge here is going to be how to fit those molecules into the current transportation fuel supply in a way that uh, actually serves a very useful purpose and provides the motoring public with the sort of performance they expect. We see this challenge again getting increasingly more difficult by 2022, and it's led to a variety of discussions about whether or not we should see fuel composition changes, whether or not we should see automotive technology changes, or whether or not there should be a revisitation of how this RFS is configured at the present time. And as we see this delta between the baseline here, which is basically the 10% use line, and the requirement to use an additional 20 billion gallons in the next decade, it clearly is a, is a huge challenge, one that certainly will meet the goal of producing more and more domestic renewable biofuels for the U.S. transportation fuel market, but clearly the issue is how do we go about doing that with present automobile technology and with the present set of, of authorizations for fuel blends that are pretty much limited at 10% or in some cases 15 volume percent. As many are aware, the RFS is constituted by a couple of different types of both conventional and advanced biofuels, and this category of cellulose is clearly a key component as well. The advanced biofuels are in large part today biodiesel, and this uh, 5 billion gallon mark here in terms of overall use is a bit misleading because a, a gallon of advanced biofuel is actually awarded 1.7 RINs, and as a result of that, the actual physical demand is closer to about 3.7 billion gallons rather than 5 billion gallons with the RINs which are used for credit and trading compliance purposes. So we really have a relatively small volume of advanced biofuel to meet. We're on track to easily meet the convinced biofuel, but we've got a significant challenge in moving forward and meeting the cellulosic standard. And while the petroleum industry took great exception to the oxygenated fuel standards, which were imposed in 1990, and they were then, in effect, rolled into the RFS in a more flexible form, in the form of using biofuels in any way, in any configuration you wanted, as long as they were used, the former oxyfuel standard was viewed as extraordinarily prescriptive, and for that reason, the petroleum industry didn't like that standard. They did embrace the RFS upon enactment, but as they now look at the cellulosic requirement, again, they've come to the conclusion that the standard is extraordinarily prescriptive, particularly given the fact that cellulosic ethanol production is not coming online at a pace that was anticipated by anybody. Here you'll see the actual cellulosic requirements versus reality. And this is a picture that's led to a lot of the litigation that's currently underway by uh, the API, by uh, large food manufacturers, and by even some environmental groups that initially were very strong advocates of the cellulosic component within the RFS. What we're seeing here, obviously, is that in 2010, there was a 100 million gallon requirement and very little, if any, biofuel, advanced biofuel, cellulosic biofuel was actually in the marketplace. In 2011, we saw about a 250 million gallon requirement under the law. EPA is able, under administrative rule, to adjust that actual requirement. They adjusted the actual requirement to 6 million gallons, and still that was a stretch. It was only met because there were some credits and trading practices that could be met, but this is a very difficult uh, objective for the petroleum industry. On the other hand, EPA's philosophy, and one that I personally applaud, is that they set the bar pretty high here, even at 6 million gallons, to continue to drive demand for this product, continue to support the commercialization efforts that are underway. In the current year, the federal requirement under RFS for cellulosic biofuels is 500 million gallons. And in fact, the standard was adjusted by EPA at 13 million gallons, and yet we're going to have an extraordinarily difficult time, as evidenced by API lawsuits, making clear that there is simply not 
the ability to meet that. They've called this a, a fictional biofuel. In fact, we're seeing some progress to getting some physical product out into the marketplace by the end of 2012. But again, it falls way short of 500 million gallons. And I think most are hopeful that it will hit that 13 million gallon mark so that that standard could be met. However, you can see the cautionary nature of USDA and their evaluation of existing cellulose biofuel facilities and whether or not they'll be commercially ready even in 2013 because they've set the standard for cellulosic ethanol in 2013 at 13 million gallons, which is the same standard as 2012. RFS has gone up in its requirement in 2013, calling for a billion gallons of cellulosic biofuel, and yet EPA's requirement under their modified um, figure here is 13 million gallons. So you see this bar chart that's calling for a huge volume, not only in the near term, but in the longer term, and yet our progress being made toward that goal has been very, very slow. And as we look down the road, uh, there's not much to suggest that it's going to accelerate at the rate of 500 million gallons between 2012 and 2013. That's led to a variety of discussions, some of which have not been constructive, others of which have been uh, more insightful in terms of what should be done. And this slide has really got a couple of different points. One is that it's important to understand that in discussions beginning as early as 2002, the authors of the Renewable Fuel Standard contemplated the possibility of a catastrophic, catastrophic event, including a drought across the U.S. that would significantly diminish corn supplies. And so they vested the EPA in consultation with the Department of Energy and the Secretary of Agriculture to take a look at what measures could be taken administratively to mitigate any issues that might come from a reduced corn supply. And that's done in a couple of different ways. One is that, in fact, in the event of a catastrophic event, EPA, in consultation with the two other federal agencies, can adjust the standard for conventional biofuels if necessary. However, it's important to also note that they put in a couple of factors that allow the flexibility that the oil industry called for upon enactment in 2007. And one of those is the whole RIN credit and trading program, these renewable identification numbers are assigned to the physical gallons of conventional ethanol when they're produced and used. And the producers and users of those are allowed to carry forward and carry back 20% of the requirement each year. So there's a buffer there that is in place. In addition to that, we have about 800 million gallons of surplus ethanol currently in storage that goes beyond demand. So when one evaluates whether or not this is a time when we'd ought to react with a panic to trying to adjust the conventional corn standard, I would argue clearly it's not, that there are, in fact, measures that were contemplated. Those measures are in place. They can be done administratively, and yet the market today suggests this would be an impractical and unwise time to make that sort of a knee-jerk reaction. As we look at the bigger picture, though, and in particular the requirements for the cellulosic ethanol production, one might consider whether or not there are other ways to make a less prescriptive component of that cellulosic ethanol by perhaps combining that with the advanced biofuel. And so part of the discussion here is that the real standard for advanced biofuels and cellulosic ethanols is to accomplish greenhouse gas reductions, in particular with cellulosic ethanol and advanced biofuels, 50 to 60 percent greenhouse gas reductions. So if the name of the game, in fact, is greenhouse gas reductions, why wouldn't we at least take a minute to consider the possibility of combining the two bars, the advanced biofuel bar that you saw at 5 billion gallons and the conventional or the, the cellulosic ethanol biofuel bar at about 16 billion gallons and take a look at a 21 billion gallon pool of biofuels that could be come from any substrate provided they accomplished a 50 to 60% greenhouse gas reduction goal. That provides more flexibility, more versatility, perhaps even more opportunity, and is less prescriptive. And it seems to me and to others that perhaps if there's going to be some adjustments, there should be at least thought to how that can be done without undermining the RFS, and in fact, continuing to encourage investment and continue to support a goal of producing more of these biofuels within the United States 
in an effort to meet the initial objective of the RFS, which is to reduce imports from foreign countries. One of the things that we've also seen here is the adverse consequences of even having these discussions about the changes in the renewable fuel standard. There are a number of companies that are currently contemplating and others who have actually executed large commercial projects in the range of 250 to $300 million in capital cost. And so to have this sort of a discussion tends to make the investment community very wary. It's already wary about the advanced biofuels as it is, given the fact that they're just now moving into commercial scale production. So this discussion about changing the standard tends to undermine confidence, and uh, that's not a good thing to do at the present time, given the need for additional jobs that come from these investments, given the, the, the results of these investments in terms of economic development, in terms of ag product utilization, in terms of liquid transportation fuel from renewable fuel feedstocks. In addition, I think it's important, as the EPA and others might contemplate, whether or not there should be changes. They are required by law to take a look at a variety of different issues that come into play. This is not just about corn supply. What they've got to take a look at is when you squeeze the balloon, where else is it going to bulge? And clearly in this case, if you start to tamper with even the conventional biofuel sector, obviously that means fewer distillers feeds product, and that's been an important export and domestic feedstock for livestock production. Clearly it's been an important driver in terms of quality jobs, particularly in rural areas of the country. It's had very little impact on food prices, but an extraordinarily beneficial impact on, on ag in terms of providing these new feed products that are available. And clearly it's mitigated the price of fuels. Uh, Nebraska, for example, by having ethanol in the marketplace, reduces fuel costs to consumers by more than $70 million a year. That's not in, insignificant in any state, but it gets to be a larger impact in a larger, more populated state. So these are all factors the USDA and other policymakers are required to consider. And I think anybody wanting to have a discussion about the renewable fuel standard needs to understand the length and breadth of these considerations. So is there a solution? As I suggested, there might be. And my suggestion would be that if there's going to be this discussion, to have it in a thoughtful manner that would, again, try to preserve the goal here of greenhouse gas reduction of making liquid transportation fuels from renewable products in the United States, reducing greenhouse gases, and continuing to spin off a variety of other benefits that I alluded to, including jobs and other economic impacts. So as you take a look at this solution, one possibility conceivably that was less restrictive and, and perhaps less prescriptive in, in other ways would be perhaps to combine these two bars, these two standards of advanced and cell cellulosic biofuels into one column here and again focus on the initial goal which is greenhouse gas reductions and make this perhaps a more flexible standard that we might have a better chance of meeting within the next decade. John had also asked me to take a look at the programs that are designed to increase ethanol use because obviously producing it is one part of the equation but we've got to use it and the blend wall that I alluded to early is a huge impediment right now mainly because we are restricted by some of the automotive technologies that's in place. In some cases, the policies and practices of the automakers themselves. In other cases, the fact that while we have more than 10 million flex fuel vehicles on the road, the automaker surveys themselves indicate that between 65 and 90 percent of the owners and operators of those vehicles are not aware of that fact, that they have a fuel choice. And we're also lagging behind in terms of infrastructure development despite a number of really focused efforts by a variety of ethanol advocates, U.S. Department of Agriculture, and many of the commodity boards in the country. And so we've got a significant challenge here in front of us, but there are a number of steps that are currently underway to try to encourage that. And in Nebraska, we're uh, deciding back to the future. Uh, again, focus on 10% ethanol blends. Uh, many of the states are still not using 100% E10. Nebraska is one of those. So focusing on consumer education, Back to the future here indicates, again, point of sale, emphasize the product, talk about its attributes, and make sure that we understand that there are a variety of benefits and, in fact, these are quality fuels and should be used by every time when they pull up to the pump. Uh, we're also advocating flexible fuel. This was the first of our flex fuel vehicles in Nebraska. Uh, this car was designed to run on 100% hydrocarbon products, began by using 10% ethanol, 
eventually we started to use 100% ethanol. So we're proud to own one of the very first flex fuel vehicles. Uh, we tried our darndest to make sure we didn't have a rear end collision and have this thing go up in a ball of flame. But in fact, it uh, proved to be a, an interesting test car that uh, sat on the Capitol Hill steps and uh, made it back to Nebraska, in fact. And failing all else, I will be leading this initiative. I think it's important that we think outside the box when we're trying to figure out new ways to use ethanol, and I'll be leader of this movement if all else fails. One of the things that John asked me to finish up with was uh, one of the things that we can do to take a look at not only using more ethanol, but trying to take a look at uh, what we can do in, in advocating for alternative fuels, including biofuels of all shapes and sizes. And so one of the things that we're really focusing on in many of the states is a, an effort to make sure that we're working more closely with the automakers and understanding what their requirements are. And what becomes very clear in taking a look at automaker requirements is that they've got to have efficiency in their automobile engines. They've got to make sure that they meet the new CAFE standards, which are really going to be moving them to higher compression engines, and those higher compression engines will need more octane. They've got to balance the need for more octane with the cost considerations that come with higher octane fuels and with the composition of current high octane hydrocarbon fuels, which tend to contain a number of carcinogens and a number of other compounds that are ozone precursors. And so we've got to have clean burning high octane fuels that are lower cost than conventional high octane gasoline. And that's clearly where biofuels, including ethanol, can play increasingly more important role in meeting the automaker requirements as they go forward. In addition, we're taking a look at what contribution we can make through biofuels in terms of meeting some of the air toxics issues that are adding to healthcare costs all across the country as we see these components of gasoline combust into the atmosphere and cause not only environmental issues, but also create a number of health concerns. We've seen in the Midwest, for example, ozone warnings again on a number of days in places like Missouri and, uh, and uh, Denver, Colorado. And we've not seen many ozone warnings for quite a long time, but this extreme heat and this concentration of fuels being combusted into hot air in certain environments is creating these warnings, and obviously it's a result of hydrocarbon combustion. So again, the role of using biofuels, taking a uh, look at what can be done to reuse both particulates and carbon monoxide, which is an ozone precursor, are very important considerations. The automakers at this point are holding a series of meetings, including uh, meetings this week in Detroit with representatives of the ethanol industry taking a look at what moves I, they might make toward higher blends that could be used in flex fuel vehicles. And one they're focusing on at present is an E30 blend. And again, taking a look at the attributes of that, uh, meets the low carbon standards, help with, helps with the greenhouse gas reductions, obviously provides some benefit in terms of reducing aromatics significantly, and it's, in fact, a renewable octane source at a low price compared to gasoline. So these are important as we take a look at the attributes. And clearly, ethanol can be an important part of meeting carbon, meeting these new CAFE credits, and reducing greenhouse gas reductions, which seems to be the compelling environmental standard for both gasolines and automobiles. Again, taking a look at some of the practices that can move beyond the conventional ethanol use in the marketplace uh, a move underway with support of U.S. Department of Agriculture in a half dozen states in the Midwest, East Coast, and Southeast. It's to really focus more clearly on the FFEs that are on the road today and try and create better awareness, not only among the owners, as I mentioned, but among the dealerships and fuel marketers to try to make clear that the owners and operators of those vehicles are aware of fuel choices and the economics of those choices. We're working with a number of organizations collectively within the ethanol industry to move toward the introduction of E15. We'll probably begin to see more E15 in the marketplace come September when vapor pressure requirements will be modified from the summertime requirements and E15 introduction will be easier in many states. We're likely to start to see a little more volume of that move into the marketplace. We've been working again, as I mentioned, with automakers and others to better understand a move toward mid-level blends and how this not meets not only automaker standards, but the standards that EPA administers in terms of environment and health. We're working with fuel marketers to encourage E85 because it is today the only alternative fuel by federal definition among the alternative fuels. And so we want to make sure that it continues as part of a 
portfolio of ethanol fuels that can be used in any sort of multi-product dispenser at retail. And we're really focusing on, a, on a, an accelerated flex fuel awareness campaign among managers of fleets, particularly large governmental fleets, as well as private fleets, and focusing, again, that messaging on consumers so they're aware that they have a choice at the fuel pump if they drive a flex fuel vehicle. We've developed a guide in cooperation with a number of different parties. We're using this with retailers as we go through efforts to try to encourage them to make investment in ethanol infrastructure. USDA has got a, a very good program. A number of state commodity organizations are continuing to provide financial resources. These sort of resources are available in terms of technical resources online or in print. Anybody wanting these can contact the Nebraska Ethanol Board. Be glad to provide either print copies of these or you can take a look at our website and provide some technical detail to anybody asking questions about ethanol infrastructure. And with that, I'd like to conclude and again appreciate uh, John Hay inviting me to make a presentation. I appreciate your patience and interest and be glad to respond to any questions. Great. Thank you, Todd. That was, uh, that was great. We have one question that, that came up early and it came up when you started talking about um, corn oil use. And basically the question is, you know, how common is corn oil use in producing biodiesel? Or maybe uh, to make that more general is where, where's the markets for this corn oil going? Um, that they're taking out of this, uh, out of the ethanol. The corn oil at this point is being, there are two sectors competing for this. In, in large part, the poultry industry, uh, we're seeing strong demand come from a number of the major poultry companies that are using this in poultry rations that they're developing. And we're also seeing some demand in the biofuel sector, again, depending on price. Uh, when uses a biofuel, this corn oil, triggers a couple of different things. One is that under the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard model, it actually gives a credit back to the, the corn refinery that produced that oil, and so there's some value to it from that standpoint. It also triggers uh, RIN value, which uh, and sometimes the year has exceeded a dollar a gallon, and it is uh, easily assimilated into the biodiesel pool. So depending on its relative cost compared to those who are competing for, particularly in the feed sector, one has got to take a look at the low-carbon fuel standard value if it's going to be marketed in California. One's got to take a look at the RIN value, and then there's a, an economic model that will suggest whether or not that's a good purchase compared to other feedstocks. We know that um, ethanol plants uh, pump water to, to create ethanol, and they pump between maybe two and four gallons of water for every gallon of ethanol. What's the impact? Is there any impact on this drought with actual processing water? Have any been challenged in that, to that extent? We had a chance to talk with one of the operators of a, a Nebraska, Western Nebraska plant on Monday of this week. He explained that they are using about three gallons of ethanol to, uh, three gallons of water to produce one gallon of ethanol. He said two of those gallons are reused within the facility, and there's actually one use of basically a gallon that, that disappears. He points out that they sell about a 63% moisture distiller's feed. A lot of that water goes back in, in the form of a liquid that's used in the livestock feed ration, and a lot of that's recirculated within the plant. We asked them about whether or not in western Nebraska at this point, at a time when we're seeing irrigation wells shut off in some basins, that was having an impact on their water availability. He said because of the efficiency employed in that and other plants, they're actually using far less water than they are permitted to use. So at this point, they have not been put into a situation where that's been a limiting factor. Thank you. Um, let's go back, keep with this distiller's grains um, with the ethanol plant itself, but uh, what about the availability of distiller's grains this coming fall and winter as we see um, some plants reduce production and, and other things? In talking to producers, most of them anticipate that we'll see um, some mitigation of corn prices as harvest begins. And in fact, um, those who read the announcement by Valero probably heard the uh, spokesman for Valero point out that they fully expected that they would be back into production probably in a September time frame. Uh, we expect an early har harvest this year, of course, and so I think that's one indicator by 
a company that has a fairly broad ethanol portfolio in a variety of different states. And so we'll continue to see a resumption of these plants moving toward 100% capacity, I believe. And I believe that's driven by two factors. One is that there continues to be a very robust demand for distiller's feed, and so the value of those is very high this year. And I think that will continue in the near future, driven by not only domestic use but by strong export demand. And number two, we've seen a good rebound in ethanol prices now that the ethanol surplus that was present at the fourth quarter of 2011, first quarter of 2012, has been used up. Uh, for example, about 30 days ago, we were seeing ethanol prices in uh, Omaha rack of about $2.05, $2.06 cents a gallon. Uh, yesterday's rack prices in Omaha are about 2.67. So we've seen a good rebound, and I think that's certainly going to help improve ethanol economics. I think one of the things that ethanol producers have learned since 2008 is that the requirements for performance optimization within the plant, uh, the need to be really strong managers and employ good management practices is extraordinarily important. And to, frankly, emulate what companies like Valero have done with their refining operations is very important. Oil refineries in a surplus market tend to simply back off refining capacity. They don't shut down the refineries. They simply back off the number of barrels that are going through the plant. And in this case, I think ethanol producers are simply backing off the number of bushels that are going through the plant. They can continue to operate the facilities. They can continue to be profitable, even if marginally so in some cases. But I think we'll see them well positioned to make a rebound come the third quarter, late third quarter, start of fourth quarter this year. Are there uh, estimates on when large amounts of ethanol from cellulosic sources will come on the market? Um, I would laughingly say about five years. That seems to have been the tagline for the last 25 years. But I think more seriously as we take a look at what we're seeing in terms of commercial investment, uh, one can look at the uh, DuPont investment over in Iowa that's a significant facility that's currently under construction. One can take a look down in southwest Kansas, the Abengoa Bioenergy Facility, again, significant size under production. And I can say that from our experience in Nebraska, we are actively working with a couple of companies that are contemplating relatively large size facilities. Now, these are not going to be the size of corn plants, but these are probably going to be sized at approximately 35 million gallons per year. So they're much larger than some of the early corn ethanol plants. And yet, uh, we'll probably see the same trend with these starting out at a certain size and starting then to gradually get larger over time. I don't think we'll see that exponential growth that we've seen in terms of the size of the corn dry mills going from 10 to 50 to 100 to 400 million gallons because of feedstock limitations locally. But I do think that we'll see these start out at a good modest size in perhaps a 35 million gallon per year size range and, and move in small increments to a slightly larger size than that. I believe that the construction schedule for those two facilities indicates that they would both be operational in about 12 to 16 months, somewhere in that time frame. So you mentioned earlier that uh, the existing ethanol infrastructure in corn ethanol is, is can be, we can attach maybe or, or co-locate a cellulosic or, or other advanced biofuel plant with that facility. If we did that, so we took a cellulosic facility and we co-located it with a corn facility, so we use the same rail, et cetera, et cetera. What kind of uh, feed byproducts or what kind of byproducts do you see coming out of that co-located facility? Again, it will depend on the feedstock itself. <clears throat> Clearly, there is the ability to make cellulosic ethanol from corn, for example. And in that kind of configuration, you'd have a fundamentally different set of byproducts, co-products that would come out of that plant than you would uh, using um, corn stover, for example, or wheat straw. Uh, primarily, what we'll see is, uh, is a residue um, I think there's been a lot of discussion about how to best use that residue, whether that has any value as a, a packing or manufacturing facility, whether it has any value as a boiler material, whether it has any use in some sort of a livestock feed configuration, depending on how it might be shaped or depending on the substrate used initially. So I think each of these technologies will yield slightly different products, and I think what they're trying to take a look at is two factors. Number one, if it's viewed as a close to quote, waste product, how do you mitigate the cost of dealing with that waste? Or number two, if in fact it is a useful asset, how do you best deploy it toward its most and best, its best and highest value and where are those markets? One of the things, uh, there's one here on E85 and, and 
they says one of the things that would speed the education of the public on E85 would be actually having pumps um, at their, the stations they use, and then obviously lower pump prices for E85. How can uh, we get more E85 pumps in key locations in East Coast State? One of the, the strategies that was initially employed by the U.S. Department of Energy was to fund some E85 stations because E85 was, in fact, is, is continuing today to be defined as an alternative fuel. So DOE was willing to put monies through their Clean Cities program. And, for example, in states like Maryland, we've seen a number of installations go up in pretty good locations. But the concern there is that it is a product that is um, basically a, a dedicated product. And so the consumer pulls up to that pump. That's the only fuel choice they have there. The, the current strategy is not one that, that employs any assistance from DOE, but it does employ opportunities to use USDA funding. And that calls for these blender pumps where there may be four or five different products that can be offered. That allows the retailer to spread that investment over four or five different fuel products rather than one fuel products. They can therefore amortize that investment more quickly and it makes it a more attractive investment proposition for the local retailer. That's one of the keys. Another key is making sure that the supplier of the E85 is able to supply that product at a price that is competitive, perhaps as much in some cases as 20% in price below the cost of unleaded gasoline. So that requires transportation efficiencies and good relationships between a fuel provider and the fuel retailer. We've seen cases where some of the ethanol producers, for example, have offered concessionary pricing at E85 pumps through local retailers. Local retailers have taken that reduced price ethanol, blended it off in E10, and done nothing to offer this lower price at the pump, which obviously will attract more consumers. So the conundrum here is making sure that the retailer understands if they have a lower price fuel, if they've differentiated themselves in the marketplace, if they've identified a good location, if they've made a low capital cost investment, and if they've supported the consumer awareness and outreach activity in the area among FFE owners, they can, in fact, be successful. But it requires a real focus and real dedication rather than just opening up a pump and saying we're open for business and hoping the consumers show up. So talk about the relationship between corn price and fuel price and, and kind of the break-even or the profitability of ethanol plants. And, and I know that that's a complicated question, but I think that that's kind of what's on our minds here today. Yeah, typically, the, obviously, the feedstock is an enormous cost, uh, constituting over half the, the input cost of, of the ethanol. And obviously, then, the energy costs that go into the plant are going to be important. The transportation costs, moving the product, the cost of uh, the capital that went into the plant, and whether or not that plant continues to carry any debt or not, whether or not there are capital reserves available to help with minor retrofitting issues that improve efficiency, whether or not the plant's been an early adapter of technology that's allowed efficiency both in enzymes, conversion rates, if they're operating rates that max maximizes the, the, the sugar conversion in the corn kernel. Um, it, it just is a host of factors. You know, there's probably 20 key factors in terms of both management and input costs. In addition to that, obviously, we've seen uh, the importance of having good value for the products that come out of that plant. And so all of those are factors that are critically important. So if we take a look back at 30 days ago when we saw corn uh, hitting the $7 mark, we saw at that point not much of a reaction in terms of distiller's feed prices yet. And we saw a pretty depressed corn or pretty depressed ethanol price situation. We saw a number of plants that were losing money. In best cases, they were probably breaking even. And those were plants that were well managed, had bought a little corn out in the future, and are plants that are not carrying much debt. I'd say even in the last 30 days, what we started to see is plants moving into the black in a number of cases. Again, these are plants that are not carrying a lot of debt, but they're plants that are able to take advantage of some transportation efficiencies. They're able to manage their plants well. They're able to, at a, because of reduced capacity, have a little longer residence time in fermenters, which gets a little higher yield, even though the output of the plant is less, the efficiency and the output are better. We've seen a corresponding improvement in ethanol prices and distiller's feed values, even in the 30-day period. So we're seeing some gradual move back by a couple plants 
toward 100% of capacity. So that balance is very, very fine. And while it's a complicated equation, each of these managers tends to understand pretty well the importance of being very cognizant of all of the factors that go into this break-even situation and to try to make sure that they're taking advantage of opportunities as they arise to make sure that they're on the north side instead of the south side of that break-even line. The, with this drought, we know that likely we're going to see less corn than was originally predicted. Obviously, that's true. The other question I'm seeing is, or I'm thinking about is that as I see this corn suffer every on the drive every morning, those test weights cannot be very good. How does that test weight, how is that going to translate into effect for these ethanol plants as they buy corn this, this next year? Again, one of the things that we're going to see, which <clears throat> to me personally is going to be an extraordinary piece of evidence one way or the other about uh, how some of these hybrids perform. As most of uh, the listeners know, uh, we've seen uh, an enormous improvement in crop genetics and in fact to the point where depending on where you're producing corn, where you're marketing corn, you're able to make variety selections that are um, really focused on end use in some cases. So we're going to take a look, I think, at whether or not this drought resistant claim that has been made is going to hold up to some extent in, in, in irrigated corn. We're going to take a look at whether or not the starch content that is advertised in some of the varieties to be slightly higher because it's intended to be a fermentable starch is going to hold up. So test weight is going to clearly be one factor, but another factor here is going to be whether or not that starch content is going to be where it needs to be, whether or not that, that germ has developed and matured to the point where uh, we can continue to get oil separation, whether or not the feed value of the distiller's feed continues to be good and the value, therefore, of the feed itself continues to hold up. So again, a, a lot of different factors are going to go into this, and I think come September, October, we're going to know an awful lot more about that than we do today. But I think it's going to be fascinating from a crop genetics and science standpoint to see what the outcome is of these se severe conditions on, a variety of, on, on corn varieties. I think that that's true. I, I'm amazed some of these, this corn looks better than it should. I mean, it, you just, with, it, it looks better than you expect it to be with how dry it's been. Well, thank you, Todd. We really appreciate your time today and your comments. Um, you know, if there's any last questions, we'll catch those as they come on. But uh, we really appreciate your comments, and, and they were very timely. And, and I know I, I learn a lot every time I, I listen to you. So we'll give it one second. I think there might be a question popping up. But uh, join us next month. We'll, our uh, topic next month will be energy codes, um, national energy codes. And so it's a little different than our typical bioenergy topics. But uh, again, energy conservation is a big piece of this whole picture. Um, the last Friday of August, and I will be sending emails out. Also, if you want to view this web webinar or share it with anybody in archive, um, I'll put up the, the link to that here in a moment but the two links are going to be e, uh, extension.org um, is one place that will have these archived, and the other place will be bioenergy.unl.edu. Thank you for joining us today, and uh, have a wonderful weekend.